Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today from the Carol Shields Auditorium at Millennium Library in Winnipeg, which is in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Inanu, and Dakota peoples, and in the national homeland of the Red River Métis. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, and I am so glad. I am so glad. I am so glad. Across the table from me is... Uh, I'm Toby. I'm an outreach librarian based out of here at Millennium Library. And um, stay tuned for my Mrs. Danvers Rebecca fan fiction. <laughs> uh, and across the table from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor, the branch head at the Louis Rail Library. And I really believe that we have the three things people look for in a podcast. Breeding, brains, and beauty. Mm-hmm. without you. Have a breathless, dramatic take on the books we're reading? Get in touch. You can find our email address and all of our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. Hang around till the end of the episode to enjoy our favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. Toby's going to tell us about the author, after which Trevor will give us a summary of the book, but first we'll do a quick little check-in with the panel. How's it going? Good. I just wanted to mention that um, Women Talking, the the film based on the book by the, of the same name by Miriam Taves, got nominated for many um, Oscars today, including Best Picture. Mm-hmm. And I think it might be the first time that a Canadian film that was directed by a Canadian director based on a Canadian book filmed in Canada has had that honor. So Ooh. big shout out to Sarah Polly um, for that one. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. I have not read that book nor seen the movie, but I place both on hold today. Yeah. So that's what happens. I'm wondering if I should wait to see the movie before I read the book or vice versa. I always recommend reading the book first, but. Probably. And given the one, uh, the two Miriam Taves books I read already, then yeah. Yeah, I probably should do that. Yeah. And, yeah. and based on uh, your episode of that talks about all my puny sorrows, I can only think that it is the feel-good movie of the winter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I uh, recently discovered a, uh, a podcast. Uh, it's not new, but it was new to me. And uh, as you know, some longtime listeners may know, I uh, firmly believe that Jeremy Brett was the finest Sherlock Holmes ever uh, to exist and that he uh, was Sherlock Holmes from the, sort of the mid '80s to the mid '90s, and I found this fun podcast called the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes Podcast. Mm-hmm. And what it is is it's a guy who watched them all when he was a kid. I think he's a little bit younger than me. And so every episode of the podcast uh, is a summary of an episode Jeremy Brett, and then he and his brother then just discuss the episode. It's full of fun facts, what they thought of it, how it compares. And so I'm about three or four in right now. And it's just like uh, catnip for anyone that <laughs> is a Jeremy Brett fan because they've got clips from the show and they've got interesting little tidbits. So if anyone uh, wants to give it a listen, it's called the uh, Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes podcast. Nice. That's very niche. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but it's my niche. <laughs> yeah. You've got a lot of niches, Trevor. You've got a lot of niches. <laughs> Well, uh, with that, we'll uh, dive into the summer. Oh. Uh, with that, we'll dive into the author bio. All right. Um, so Daphne du Maurier, she was born May 13th, 1907 in London, England. Um, her parents were both successful actors and there were lots of other artists in her family. Um, her grandfather was George du Maurier, who was a writer and cartoonist, most known for Punch, which was a weekly satirical magazine. Um, her paternal uncle was a playwright. She was a cousin of the Llewellyn Davies boys, who were J.M. Barry's inspiration for the characters in Peter Pan. Um, her older sister became became an actress and writer. Her younger sister was a painter. Um, and these days we think of artists as not having much money, but 
these were rich artists, I guess. Um, de Maurier had a very privileged upbringing. She had a private tutor in Paris and spent her youth sailing, traveling, and writing. And her family connections really helped to establish her literary career. She published early short works in her great uncle's magazine. To encourage her, her publisher told her to write a novel. And so she did. That became The Loving Spirit, which was published in 1931. The novel drew the attention of a young British army major, Frederick Browning, who, after reading it, resolved to meet her. And he did. And they had a quick courtship and they got married in 1932. She spent the next many years writing and raising children, twin careers that she didn't find difficult to do together, though she did have lots of help. At one point, her family lived at a place called Menabilly, which would be the inspiration for Manderley in her 1938 novel, Rebecca. And she really loved Menabilly, even though it was pretty decrepit. It was cold, infested with rats, and pieces of an old wing kept falling off. So she was very prolific. She wrote 29 novels, dozens of short stories, plays, and nonfiction. Rebecca was her most successful work, and it has actually never gone out of print. There, of course, have been several film adaptations of her work, including Hitchcock's 1940 Best Picture winner, Rebecca, as well as his film The Birds, which was based on one of her short stories. And I liked this anecdote. She was on the BBC radio program called Desert Island Discs, where a guest is asked to choose a book and a luxury item that they would take to a desert island. She chose the collected works of Jane Austen as her book and a whiskey and ginger ale as her luxury. (laughs) She died April 19th, 1989, at the age of 81. After her death, there was a lot of speculation about her relationships with several women, In letters, she talked about how she believed there to be two distinct sides to her personality, a loving wife and mother, which she showed to the world, and what she called the lover, which had a male energy and propelled her writing. Even as a child, she said she had a male alter ego, who she named Eric Avin. She was what she called a half-breed, female on the outside, with a boy's mind and a boy's heart. She cut her hair short, played sports, and wore boy's clothes. And I just thought that part of her bio was really interesting to think of in the context of Rebecca, where we see the sexual tension between women characters, but also in a contemporary context where there's just so much more freedom to present your gender and sexuality in various ways. And how would she define herself now? Mm -hmm. Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. That's the first line. It's spoken by an unnamed woman as she recounts a dream she had about a place she lived once. A whirlwind romance between the narrator a young, shy woman employed as a travel companion, and a brooding, handsome millionaire named Maxim de Winter in Monte Carlo blossoms into marriage, and before she knows it, they are returning to England after their European honeymoon. Specifically, they're returning to Manderley, the sprawling historic home that has been in the family for hundreds of years. Maxim's first wife, Rebecca, drowned about a year before, but her presence is felt everywhere in the house. The housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers, is especially cool towards the new Mrs. De Winter, and the narrator struggles to measure up to her former namesake. As the narrator tries to carve out her own identity in her new life, she slowly begins to realize that marriages, like old houses and creepy housekeepers, all have their secrets. Creepy housekeeper is right. Or is it a sexy housekeeper, depending (laughs) on who uh, uh, plays the role? Well, in this book, no. No. (laughs) So, um, how did we find it? Well, you just said you had so many hot takes, so I'm I I'm do. throwing it back to you. Yeah, you're, throw, you're throwing it to me for yeah. the hot you, takes. You yeah. always wait to hear what we have, uh, Toby and I have to say, exactly. and, then, and then you kind of get a lay of the land, and then you can so this, <laughs> this this time, let's hear it, Dennis. Okay. I, well, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I have to say, this this book was a trip. Like, I started out reading it several weeks ago. I've said before on the podcast, I'm not really a fan of overly flowery language. I like some stuff that's more direct. And this one starts out with that whole dream sequence, which is just agonizingly full of uh, flowery language. Literally so much talk about flowers. (laughs) And I found it really difficult to motivate myself to read. And in fact, I didn't read it for a couple of weeks. I had to read two thirds of the book on uh, the last two days to finish it. As I was reading, I started to realize that she wasn't just employing flowery language for its own sake, even though some writers do that. She was really painting pictures and setting a stage. She, uh, one of the rules of good writing is, you know, show, don't tell. And that's what she did 
completely. It was all show, never telling. And so I started to get into it more with that. And the other thing about this book is that she stretches out every encounter, everything to the longest possible length. The pacing is agonizing in some ways. When they have small talk, she doesn't just say they have small talk about the weather. She goes into the whole conversation. She stretches it out. So as I'm reading this and I'm, you know, going through and kind of feeling the tension and the pacing, and I'm seeing all these different things that she's doing with the book, all these different character things. And then the pacing goes even up to the end where they're like, you know, Maxim is rushing back to the house because he, he feels he has to get back there. And she's like kind of, she's still talking about frivolous things. She's imagining the future. They're, they take a stop for tea on the drive back, even though he's rushing, rushing, rushing. And in that last paragraph where, spoilers, I guess, they come back and Manderley is burning. And it stops right there. The whole novel goes along at this excruciatingly slow pace. And right at the end, bam, it hits you and it stops instantly. And uh, I was so impressed with this book. That, that's kind of one layer of what impressed me. But up until the last page, I would have said it's a pretty good book. And in the, the last line sold it for me as an incredible book, which I've never had happen. I've never had a book, uh, one or two books are kind of, you know, the last chapter or whatever really makes it. But this one, the last line just kills it for me. It just finishes it off and makes it magnificent. So that's my initial take. <laughs> I think you, well, you definitely like this book more than I did. Um, <laughs> I, I found that pacing excruciating. I was just waiting for things to happen. I hated all the characters. They're all just awful people. And normally that's not enough to make me dislike a book, but here it was. And like, you just, you spend all your time in the narrator's head <laughs> and she's just, it, she's a feminist nightmare. Like she's just, <laughs> she's awful. And then I just, I really disliked the ending where Jack Favell is right all along about Maxim killing Rebecca and he's treated so poorly. They're just like, you're a drunk. Get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. And he's right, but no one believes him. I, I hated that. I found it so frustrating. I thought that was part of the brilliance of this thing, though. Like the, that was part of the tension the whole time, right? Like, like Favel was an ass. He was such a loathsome character. And so did uh, Cousin Kisser. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many levels on which to dislike him, right? He's having an affair with his cousin. He's a smarmy sa a car salesman type, <laughs> right? Who, But he's in love with her, and he's, he's right. Like, Maxim mm. killed her. I know, but there's the thing. Maxim is wealthy. I was trying to figure out a lot of the way through the book, like, how, how do they have so much money? Like, what does he do? And eventually I figured out he's just a landowner. He gets rent. Uh, he does nothing except collect rent from people. So he's one of these rich parasites who, uh, you know, has money because he inherited the land and everything from his uh, parents. He adds nothing particular of value aside from, I mean, he's kind and he's generous. And you want to see him suffer. Yeah. You want to see him get caught. Well, the thing is, like, he's, but there's the thing, he's protected. He's protected because of his station. The people investigating and doing the inquiry and stuff like that, they want to just pass it off. They don't even want to do the formality of the inquest. They, they just want to say, oh, they're like the party sorry, the man, you're yeah. suffering so much. We're, we're, we'll protect you. The status quo. Yeah, like when Jack gets Ben to come in to testify and he tries to bribe him and, and the magistrate is like, yeah, I guess this is fine. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. That made me so angry. Like, this is not the proper way to conduct an investigation. No, no. And that's the thing. Like, they're, they're worried the whole time Maxim's going to go to jail, you know, and, and, and there's the unnamed narrator who's like, oh, no, but now I love him because he never loved Rebecca. <laughs> and that's okay somehow. And it's like, oh, you're, you're so damaged, lady. You're, you, but you can tell that from the beginning, too. Like, she comes from a poor background. She's got no family. She had nothing to look forward to, and she got swept away. And she was willing to accept almost anything for that possibility. Including that, a man who killed his first wife. Yes. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> Do you think we were supposed to feel sympathy towards Maxim? Like, as a reader, were we supposed to like the ending? Because that's quite a feat if, if we are supposed to sympathize 
And some of the interpretations are that uh, the ending is happy because they get to finally be together, which is super twisted. Yeah. One of the things I, I really liked about the novel, too, is like uh, there, there's another rule of good writing that says start as close to the end as possible. And this novel starts after the story is done, pretty much. Like it starts at the denouement that you would normally have at the end of the book to wrap it up and see what happened to people. But no, it's right there at the beginning. And they don't seem happy, right? Like. She, she's talking about how, oh, yes, now we're happy. We, we might seem trifle dull. We, we've had too much drama. We just sit here and, we, you know, we do our little thing and they, every day is the same. And, and, yeah, we think about Manderley a lot. But really, every, everything's good, really. Like, it's so pathetic. It's so broken. Like, they've been broken by what happened to them. And so... That's what I, happens when you murder your wife. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's the other thing, too, like... Okay, he murdered his wife. Absolutely. But she was... Was she? Mm. Was she? <laughs> yes. All You by, only hear about by her... By Miss Danvers' own words. Mrs. Danvers talked about what she was when she was talking to, uh, to the narrator. She was talking about how from the very young age, she knew how to manipulate everyone around her. She took what she wanted. She did not care for anyone. So much so that Mrs. Danvers herself didn't really realize that Rebecca had just wrapped her around her finger, too, and made her love Rebecca the way she made everyone love Rebecca. Favel, too, talked about how Rebecca was a narcissistic person. Like, uh, you would, if you diagnosed her, it would be narcissistic personality disorder, but at least as a late person. we only hear about her from other people. She, yeah. she can't speak for herself. No, and yeah. that's part of the brilliance of the novel. Okay, so <laughs> so here's my other thing from this. They never tell us the narrator's name. And that was something that was bugging me when I was reading it. Like I had gone the, after the first third of the novel, and then we watched, uh, the three of us got together and watched the, the Hitchcock movie. And it was bugging me that I couldn't remember her name. And I was watching the movie, I realized they never say her name. They always say Mrs. De Winter or The Bride or Darling or something like that. They, no one ever says her name. And in the book, too never mentioned and it's intentional because the book is not about her at all the book is entirely about rebecca it is rebecca described by the effect she had the story told about her by you know describing the people around her in the wake of her death but it's all rebecca she is the central focus for everything and uh, at the end there she goaded maxim into killing her because she did not want to die from cancer. That's another thing I don't buy. That's a pretty like wild assumption to be like, I'm going to pretend I'm pregnant with someone else's baby. So my husband murders me. Well, OK, I got <laughs> to separate two things when I, in talking about this book. There were a lot of things that bugged me as I was reading. The motivations of a lot of the characters often felt weak. The way people talk to each other. Uh, maybe because like this was like you know in the thir late thirties, maybe people did talk to each other that way, but it didn't. A lot of the dialogue didn't seem natural. There were a lot of flaws with the the morality of every character, like you mentioned, and I think that's all valid criticism. Is just for me, it kind of falls away in the wake of the reveals, especially at the end, uh, where Manderley, which has been built up the entire novel, that's the other character that is really the center of everything. Right? There's Rebecca. And there's Manderley. And the whole novel is about how wonderful Manderley is. The, the narrator has been in love with Manderley since she was a child, since she saw a picture postcard of it. Everyone talks about it. It's been around for 100 years. It's the most important building in the area. Everyone in England seems to know about it. Everyone abroad knows about it. All you have to do is that's the guy who owns Manderley. It's built up to this impossibly important thing. And then it burns. So... um I forget where I was going with that exactly. <laughs> so all these flaws that are in the early part of the novel, in a way for me, they kind of fall away. Like it could have been better written in, in many different ways to create a, a, the same kind of story. But in the end, none of it matters because it's about how Rebecca was such a captivating narcissist that she controlled all these people around her her whole life. And at the end, when she was going to suffer and die... She managed to manipulate her husband to kill her, knowing, maybe knowing in the process or not caring anyway, that by doing so, she would also set events in motion that would destroy this last thing that he loved more than anything else that had been around for hundreds of years. And it didn't matter. She was going down and she took 
everything with her. Blaze just took everything out. She won. In the end, she lived life exactly like Mrs. Danvers said she wanted to. She took from life whatever she could, and she didn't care who what had happened to anybody else. And at the end there, a perfect example of it. She took everything from everyone around her. And the narrator, the unnamed narrator, is irrelevant in all of this. Rebecca never met her. Rebecca doesn't know her. Rebecca didn't know it would affect her. Doesn't care. This young woman who was so fragile and vulnerable and misguided and trying her best to keep up, and she builds up and she starts to have dreams. She starts to come into her own. She starts to become this woman that she's imagined. Gone. In a moment. All because of Rebecca, who couldn't have cared less. That's what I think is magnificent about this book. It's a portrait of, uh, of a psychopath who, and the wake of destruction that they left. And uh, everyone else was just a bit player in that because Rebecca wouldn't have cared who was there. That's what makes it a magnificent book for me. And all the characters are loathsome. I mean, I have some sympathy for the narrator because you're in her head so much and, and she is trying, even if she's misguided. And but. Frank might be the only one who's somewhat redeemable. Frank's pretty nice. Yeah. yeah. Although he and might Jasper. know that Max <laughs> killed Rebecca and he's... He probably did. Yeah. Yeah. And Jasper. Yeah, of course, Jasper. And Jasper. the old dog who just is sleeping yeah. throughout the whole novel. <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry, I've been talking a lot here because, uh, like I said, this, it just blew me away at the end there. Boy, maybe we shouldn't have let Dennis go first. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> but... Surely, the, but the thing is that I liked about it is there were so many layers. It, cause when I was I was looking at reviews on uh, Goodreads afterwards to see if anyone else had the same take that I did, and I didn't see it represented at all. People were talking about all kinds of other aspects to the book, and there's so many. You can easily get a very different experience from reading it than I did. So what was yours? Well, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I mean, for me, the fact that it starts off with somebody describing a dream they had, I mean, one of the probably the most boring things someone can ever do to somebody is explain a dream they had the night before, because it doesn't matter. It's not interesting. And this entire book, in a way, springs from a dream. But having said that, that is also its strength, because like I think, and you mentioned this too, Dennis, is that when you get to the end of the book, there's this interesting trick because if you then go back to the beginning of the, the book and if you skip over chapter one and go to chapter two, it's like this, um, like a master class of foreshadowing because it's almost like you could stick chapter two at the very end of the book because at that point it talks about, you know, it name checks Mrs. Danvers, it, it name checks Favel, characters we have not heard of yet at this point. It even talks about the cottage by the cove and uh, she imagines someone, you know, stumbling onto the um, property and coming across the little cottage and uh, she, there's this line, uh, there might linger there still a certain atmosphere of stress, which mm -hmm. is the understatement of the year in terms of like, yeah, somebody was murdered there. And uh, there was also all kinds of things going on in that cottage, uh, you know, and, and uh, even Jasper gets mentioned, the dog. And so all these things that now that we've come to the end of the story, the tale, and we go back. Yeah, she's wondering, oh, I wonder where they are. I wonder what happened to them. She talks about the leaves. They sound like the stealthy movement of a woman in an evening dress. And then when they shiver suddenly and they fall and they scatter, they might be the patter patter of a woman's hurrying footsteps. And just this uh, idea that it's quite an interesting, almost like a Mobius strip where you could go back and then before you know it. And then by the end of chapter two, she segued from talking about Manderley and she's into the story of her being in the employ of Mrs. Van Hopper in Monte Carlo. And it's, I just reread that chapter this morning and it was just interesting how it's seamlessly just sort of like if it were a film, it kind of just goes from the back and just kind of slowly kind of pans out and then we're in the present day, but not really the present day because we're still in a memory. So we're in the middle present day and then going forward. So the structure of it, I found, was intentional and it really did help get the feeling across that we're in a, a memory, we're in a dream and we're from one person's perspective, which makes you wonder wonder as you read it, how much of this can you really believe? I, I don't know necessarily if the narrator is an unreliable narrator, but she is seeing things only from the perspective as she sees it. And she does seem to be so naive that the revelations that come 
come maybe a little bit later than the reader. I feel like she's always kind of playing a little bit uh, catch up, which again, kind of adds to the whole eeriness of it. Cause like, as you're reading this, you're like, something's not right here. And she's cluing into it, but not fast enough. So that, that tension I found was almost unbearable. Uh, mm. That things were stretched out to the point where you just want her. And, and of course, you know, we're reading it now in 2022. And I just feel like. 23. Mm? 20, 2023. 23. You're in the past, Trevor. You're in the <laughs> Thank past. You very much. Well, I, yeah, you're right. I can't even say it was starting in 2022. I didn't start in 2023. We're reading it almost a uh, hundred years after it was written, and uh, maybe we have different ideas. But like, for example, that first scene where she wants to light the fire in the uh, library, and, and Frith says, "Oh well, normally the fire isn't uh, lit till the afternoon, uh, Mrs. De Winter." You, you, it was in the, I would have been like, "I don't care what Mrs. De Winter said. <laughs> I want to light this fire in the, in the library." But you know, mm-hmm. you have to go along, well, along with it. So anyway, I don't know. What I'm talking about, but I did want to mention one thing was that most of this book I actually didn't read I uh, listened to as an audiobook and I just want to give a shout out to the narrator her name was Anna Massey and you can find it in two parts on uh, YouTube and apparently she played Mrs. Danvers in a 1979 BBC production and you'll never guess who played Maxim in that production Jeremy Brett aka Sherlock Ooh. Holmes so <laughs> nice it all, tie in there. yeah it all, it all comes around so and here's something interesting too that Anna Massey the narrator was at one point married to Jeremy Brett before mm. they filmed this. And uh, she claims that he uh, left her for a man. Mm. And she referred to him as a homosexualist. Homosexualist? Thought, yeah, which I thought was an interesting term. I haven't heard that before. Mm. Anyway, that's audiobook is, is worth worth checking out. Yeah. I You know, I was thinking, too, uh, about the unreliable narrative aspect of it. Because she was in the sense that, like you said, she was really naive and uh, didn't seem to pick up on a lot of stuff around her. And she was really passive. And like cause those times, you know, she's worried that someone thinks this about her, someone thinks that about her. And you're reading it and thinking, yeah, probably not. It's only kind of after the ball and that uh, dramatic confrontation and then the sinking ship that she finally kind of comes into her own and starts thinking, you know, I got to stop worrying about this stuff and I'm just going to. I'm going to be bolder and I'm going to do things. And at that point, I felt like she came across as reading the situation better. Mm. But before that, she was so timid about everything and so reluctant to take charge and so so focused on her own inadequacies that there were a lot of stuff that she clearly was misreading and the reader has to kind of interpret what's saying because of her um, of her nature, of her behavior. So it's not the traditional unreliable narrator where you think the narrator is lying or um, under the influence of drugs or or something like that. Like it's an unreliable narrator in just the sense that the character herself doesn't know enough to know what's happening around her, which is very interesting and is very well done. Well, and after the ball too, it seemed like uh, once uh, Maxim was able to sort of confide in her and and the whole obstacle of. Rebecca being removed in the sense that uh, the narrator realized that her uh, Maxim didn't love her and, and, and never did. Then she really got on board quickly with the idea of, <laughs> of uh, like uh, hiding the fact that uh, her husband murdered her. Uh, and, and she yes. became very crafty and very, you know, we can say this, we could do this, we could do this. How about this? And yeah, she's I, right on board. You yeah. killed your wife. Okay. Yeah. How can she's I like, help? You, yeah. You, you hate her. You murdered her. Let's, yeah. let's do this. She's been salivating for a certain type of uh, attention and, uh, and love. And, and acceptance, and she finally had it. I mean, there, I, I, one of the reviews that I saw of it on Goodreads, the person was saying that they thought that the narrator was uh, at the end or at the beginning, I guess, when she said that they were happy now, that maybe it's because now Maxim was dependent on her. Now she controlled Maxim, essentially. She was no longer the pet Maxim was because he was broken now, and she had that position I don't know that I buy that, but I can see how someone might think that. Yeah, I don't see Maxim as broken at the end. I think, you know, Manderley is gone, but him and his wife are going to go off to Monte Carlo or whatever and live happily ever after. Well, that's the question. Do you think that they do end up happy based on reading that, uh, like reading chapter two? Like, I reread it after I, I finished the book because I realized with the ending there that it was going to wrap around there. And Was he ever happy, though? I mean, he's not, not a, he's a no. terrible guy. Yeah. 
He's cold. He's distant. He treats her like crap. He calls her names. I mean, yeah. this is not. I'm asking a, you to marry me, you little idiot. Or yeah. you little, little this is not a happy whatever. relationship in any way. No. And, you know, people under duress do often not live up to their potential in terms of being nice. I mean, he was n- nicer when they were not at Manderley, you know, when they first yeah. met. So it seems like. And he was much more loving after he confessed to murdering his wife. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to say. I mean, again, a lot of the characters were not really likable. It was fascinating. <laughs> you could have a book with so many unlikable characters and still really keep you following along. Yeah, it's sort of like <laughs> instead of seeing, well, which character do you like? It's like, which character did you hate the least? Like, and I thought, like, you know, Maxim's sister, Beatrice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of liked her and that she, even though she was, you know, pompous and stuff, she, uh, yeah, I don't know, she, I felt like she kind of cut through a lot of Maxim's crap and kind of said things the way that she saw them. She was straightforward, yeah. and a lot of other characters were not. But we have to talk about Mrs. Danvers, right? Mm. Oh, like, yeah. Like, I mean. <laughs> so, so one of the questions I had throughout most of the story is, why didn't he fire her? Why didn't he send her away? And he does say at one point he was worried she would know or she'd be suspicious if he did. But, like, she was clearly also a psychopath. It had to be really obvious, right? The, those conversations with the narrator, that ain't anywhere close to normal or acceptable. He doesn't really directly interact with her, though, in the same way that Rebecca or the narrator does. Well, he does that one meeting where he's telling her, Favel can't be here anymore. Mm-hmm. And I, this is the last warning. And it sounds like this is not the first discussion about that. So they do have some interactions. And yeah, he keeps his distance from her, but like he owns the place. I think it's exactly that. I think because he owns the place, he probably feels like nothing can touch him at home and he doesn't have a lot to do with her. So whenever the narrator was bringing up Mrs. Danvers, he was kind of almost laughing it off. He's like, oh, my darling, it seems like you're afraid of her. And she goes, I am afraid of her. And he goes, oh, or whatever. It's just like, you know, she can't hurt you. She's the the hired help. Uh, He didn't really, I don't think, ever realized how crazy she was but he he did though because he acknowledged to her like he acknowledged to the narrator that at one point that he had been afraid to dismiss her because he was worried she'd make the connection at some point but like if she's going to make the connection she's going to do it even faster right there i think that was a real bad choice on his part did maxim (laughs) know that mrs danvers was keeping that bedroom all like the way like was he on like i I don't really mention that i mean the One of the things about this book, like, you know, you see those movies and they say this movie would have been five minutes if someone had just talked to each other about what was happening. (laughs) This whole book is people who didn't talk to each other for the longest time and really, really, really should have. Yeah. They should have just sat down and say, okay, listen, I got to tell you something about my wife. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it didn't have to be, yeah, I murdered her, but there there could have been a little talk about how it was a really bad relationship. And, you know, um, that's why he's so flaky a lot of the time because he's got all this trauma from his uh, abusive wife. But nope, he just refuses to talk about it all the time and freaks out. And she refuses to engage him on it because she doesn't want to spoil anything. She worries that bringing up any negativity is going to destroy her fantasy that she's living right now. So, well, and, so no and, one talks. And reputation uh, was so important. I mean, <laughs> he was only married about four days the first time when uh, Rebecca was like, oh, uh, darling, there's something I need to tell you about. And then he like, it's a, it was so unspeakable. I won't even repeat it. But it was just like, a, you know, saying this is this is really who I am. But don't worry, uh, we can strike a deal and I will pretend to be the perfect wife and the perfect hostess and you will have Manderley and you'll have everything and I'll have my own life. Deal? I mean, I, I don't, don't see what's so bad about that. Like, really? I mean, so they don't get along as spouses, but they pretend and they each can do their own thing. Well, I think the, I mean, the way it was described in the book, what did it ultimately for Maxim was that she kept doing it at Manderley right in his face, like just rubbing it in his, like he could accept. Yeah, because she also had a flat in London that she would go to and he was okay with that, I guess. Yeah, because that was off in London. It wasn't at Manderley. It wasn't right in front of him. He could pretend or just ignore it. And also this brought up to me that Margaret Atwood line, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. And that's what happened here. 
Mm. <laughs> and I mean, you can argue about, you know, whether, I mean, I think she, Rebecca did want to die uh, fast because she didn't want to suffer. So like she wanted that, but still that, that dynamic is definitely there where the loss to Maxim is his pride and being laughed at. And the consequences for Rebecca are death. So, uh, yeah, that's part of the <laughs> kind of, it's a different time and place in the book. Women are really treated as fluffy little accessories in the book. And again, Rebecca flies in the face of that too, because she refused as a character, like she refused to be anyone's fluffy anything. Like she could pretend and be fashionable and stuff, but she did it so that she was clearly in charge and everyone knew she was the one doing everything. But she took charge, and you can almost see her as a hero in that regard. Like, if you wanted to reframe the novel, she's the good person who managed to get vengeance upon her murderer by, you know... Making his life hell. Yeah. <laughs> but in the end, like, you know, she avenged her murder through Mrs. Danvers, who was loyal to her and carried out the ultimate punishment that she could. If you wanted to, you could reframe it that way. I still think they were all bad. And, uh, there are so many layers. And also the, the language... Like, I don't like flowery language much, but I was really impressed by how she engaged all the senses throughout the writing. It was never just a visual description. There was always the smells of the flowers, the, the petal on the ground that she picked up and smelled, and it was the same smell as on the thing in uh, Rebecca's uh, cove shack there. The sounds everywhere, the different birds, uh, even when they're in the middle of the most stressful thing that she's describing, the sounds of people walking by and the ships going by in the bay and like, uh, or the lake or the whatever the body of water was right nearby, constantly engaging every sense. And I'm not very good at picking up, like I don't visualize well, but she really went through like every sense all of the time when she was describing things. I think there's one one chapter that begins with the narrator waking up. I think it might be the morning of the uh, the inquest, and she's just describing like the yeah, the birds and nature and the garden and how like these will all continue long past she's here or Manderley and that this kind of this she has this kind of like cosmic awareness that she's and everything that she knows is insignificant. And it just was kind of an interesting like way to kind of set the tone for that whole day as it, as it went on. I did enjoy all the flowers throughout this book. The flowers not only surrounding Manderley and the tunnel on the way to mm. get to the house, but the flowers in the Happy Valley, the flowers that are brought into the house and sort of are among every room. It it's, was very fragrant almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could see like a live performance of the, you could really enhance it by having all the flowers in the, in the auditorium. <laughs> yeah. smell vision <laughs> Yes. Rhododendron is just a great word. Rhododendron, mm -hmm. yeah. They're red, right? So there's sort of that, that blood kind of, you know, foreshadowing, the, yeah. the, like a tunnel of blood you go through on your way to uh, get there. That was the one downside to the Hitchcock movie. It was black and white. <laughs> yes. You couldn't really see all that color. Although it did make Mrs. Danvers look even more ghoulish, I thought. <laughs> Still too pretty for, for what I was picturing. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. The reveal, though, that she had raised Rebecca... Like the movie, the Hitchcock movie anyways, doesn't mention any of that. She's just a really big fan of Rebecca's. But in the book, it's clear that she was essentially a mother figure because she'd raised her from a very young age and that she looked upon her that way. This was like her daughter, except she was also like nobody's child because she lived on her own terms. But like it was like her child, but also someone that she admired and almost worshipped as like the ultimate person. That Rebecca was this perfect specimen. I don't know what you call the relationship uh, exactly between Danvers and Rebecca. Creepy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> there was almost wasn't there a kind of a, a sexual tension oh, feeling yeah. in that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That whole scene with Danvers taking the narrator through her bedroom and getting her to touch all of the the linens and the clothes and. So creepy. Yeah, but also like very sexually charged. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting is it, how, you know, if that, if that happened on the first day that uh, the narrator was in the house, that might have been like, okay, that's it, I'm out. But it was sort of like a slow burn, right? It didn't happen until the narrator was living in Manderley for a while and, and kind of got accustomed or attuned to the way the, the house operated before Mrs. Danvers really kind of invited her in 
No, I guess she didn't really invite her into the West Wing. Uh, no, she, was she found her. There, she found her. Yeah. But then she, she didn't seem super angry. She was sort of like, oh, if you had wanted to see it, I would have, I would have shown you this any time. And yeah. yeah. Mrs. Danvers was really hard to read until she started getting like totally creepy. Uh, yeah, like when she was kind of encouraging her to jump out the window and oh, like, oh, yeah. don't, you won't feel a thing. I was going to say originally, like when I saw that scene in the movie and then when I read it in the book, it seemed almost unrealistic to me that, like, does that ever work? Like telling someone to jump out the window? But then I remembered that news story about like a nurse in Minnesota who used to go into chat groups and find vulnerable people online and then voice chat with them and convince them to commit suicide. And he did this several times and he was finally arrested for it. And it was difficult to prosecute because it was such an unusual crime. And it's like, I guess it does happen. Because it has happened. It's still like a weird concept to think you can talk someone into jumping out a window while you're standing there being all super creepy with them. But that may also have to do with your comment earlier about how each scene in the book is stretched to its breaking point. And when we get to that point where Mrs. Danvers is standing next to the narrator, it hasn't just started. We've, we've read 15 to 20 pages of, mm-hmm. of them going through the room and looking at this stuff. So at that point, you know, we're probably all ready to jump out the window. <laughs> Isn't is that scene also pretty soon after the ball? It's yes, the same. Yeah. So it's the very. Right, I it's think the very, isn't it because isn't or, or the, the 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 thing that stops it is the flares that go up yeah. because of the the ship. I think and and yeah. and uh, the narrator doesn't re- know whether those were fireworks for the ball or if they were. Yeah, that was all within twenty four hours. Yeah. The ball, uh, the night. Uh, Maxim doesn't show up. She's looking around. Danvers gets super super creepy and tells her no one wants her there and that mm-hmm. she's a big failure and why doesn't she just jump out the window and. And you don't know if she's going to or not, but then boom, there's rockets. Well, you do know that she's not going to because we have the beginning where she's clearly well, still alive. True, true. But in the moment, it kind of feels like maybe she would have, maybe she wouldn't. It's hard to tell if she would have been convinced to do it or if she would have told Danvers to back off and, and run away or something. Or like it could be like a Gone Girl situation where Mrs. Danvers kills the narrator and assumes her identity. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Well, you know, she was saying, I won't push you out the window, but it's like, won't you? <laughs> can we trust that? I mean, you later burn down the whole building, so I'm not sure we can trust that Danvers would not have committed violence. Oh. And apparently got away with it, because in Chapter 2, they're mentioning she wonders what happened to them, so right. they she didn't get caught, and she apparently lived. She ran off into the woods. A lot, uh, Still ambiguity. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the different theatrical and television versions deal with Mrs. Danvers in different ways. Yeah. Well, the Hitchcock movie, they show her dying again because I guess they wouldn't want to show anyone doing bad things getting away with it in that, at that time. It's apparently also why in the Hitchcock version, you don't actually see Max shoot his wife. She kind of like they struggle and she falls and bangs her head because they, the, the censors wouldn't allow somebody to kill their wife in cold blood and get away with it kind of thing. So yeah. they had to kind of massage some of those finer points. And it really takes away from the impact of the book when they did that. I feel like we watched the movie together before I had read most of the book. And uh, yeah, I felt the movie was pretty good, but it was watered down. Yeah, it doesn't really follow that, you know, they would get into an argument, she would fall down, hit her head and die, and then he'd be like, oh, well, I'll just put her on this boat. And Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. Why are you covering up an accident, man? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, we already know that the, the law in that town is not going to give you any trouble. Yeah, mm-hmm. Very true. He probably could have shot her in the chest and just said, oh, it was a hunting accident and everybody would have been <laughs> fine. <laughs> it's like a Dick Cheney situation. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> the man who got the person he shot to apologize to him yeah, for getting yeah, shot yeah. by him. Uh, to apologize to the vice president for uh, putting him through this ordeal. Yeah. Oh, um, I feel like we could talk more still, but we're kind of getting low on time. So does anyone have any final comments they would like to make about this one? I was worried we wouldn't have much to say about this book. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm glad it ended up being a being a good good one for discussion. Same. Yeah. I will say, if you are reading it, I recommend reading it in as short a period of time as you can. I feel like the book has a lot more impact when you are reading it straight through. I know I often read kind of chopped up, but uh, because I had to read a lot of it in two days, I really felt that increase the impact on me. But definitely recommend it. So with that said, um, maybe we'll talk about book recommendations. Or can you tell me a book I would also like? 
I don't know if this would necessarily be a book that you may also like, but I feel like this is almost just like a, a public service announcement that if you are a fan of Rebecca, you may be interested to know that there are other books in the Rebecca verse. For example, everything ranges from uh, something that's officially approved by the estate to pretty much glorified fan fiction. So I'm just going to take you through a couple of these. One of them is called Mrs. De Winter by Susan Hill. It was published in 1993. It takes place 10 years after the events of Rebecca. The De Winters return to England for Beatrix's funeral and buy another estate and plan to start over again. But complications ensue. Followed by Rebecca's Tale by Sally Bowman in 2001. Now, this one was actually officially sanctioned by the estate, and it takes place 20 years after the events of Rebecca and loosely follows the continuity. But the main character in this one is a super minor character from Rebecca. It's uh, Colonel Julian. Uh, if you remember, towards the end of the book, he was the chap who uh, kind of... The magistrate. Uh, the magistrate, exactly right. Uh. Uh, and so he tries to get answers. He's reminded of Rebecca because a, a, a mysterious young man comes to Cornwall with questions. So Colonel Julian and Colonel Julian's daughter kind of poke around to try to find out what really happened. And and I think maybe perhaps, yeah, Toby, you might enjoy this because it kind of maybe redeems Rebecca in a certain way that uh, we get. To, I mean, obviously, none of this is canon, but, uh, you know, uh, you get to learn a little bit more about her and maybe why she, uh, things happened the way they did. And then I just want to mention this last one, which doesn't make any sense at all, but it's just called The Winters by Lisa Gabrielle. It came out in 2018. It's sort of more like a fractured fairy tale version of Rebecca because it takes place in modern America. There's an unnamed protagonist as well, but she falls in love with a Max Winter. Uh, I guess they got rid of the duh because it's America. And he's a powerful U.S. senator. And they come back to his uh, Long Island mansion, Asherley. <laughs> and uh, his first wife, Rebecca, but spelled with two Ks has died but his teenage daughter who's called danny is there <laughs> and uh she's large and in charge so you can imagine i mean i wouldn't read any of these <laughs> but i just feel like you know we, we you should be aware that these exist out there in the world so my that's my that's mine half-hearted recommendation yeah, yeah like i'm not really recommending them for you to read i just think that you know is a public service everyone needs to be aware that these books exist in the world and the library has two of the three hmm. I thought when you started talking that you were going to um, talk about Jane Eyre. Oh, um, yeah. And that was going to be my recommendation. But the more I thought about it, the more I was like, oh, I'm kind of just meh about Jane Eyre. So I don't want to recommend it. But Jane Eyre was, I don't know if it was a ripoff, uh, if Rebecca's a ripoff of Jane Eyre. But this book is obviously influenced by Jane Eyre. We've got the creepy housekeeper. We've got like... Um, you know, a mad slash dead wife in an attic. We've got, you know, a very gothic setting, but Jane Eyre is just okay. I wouldn't recommend it. So I wanted to recommend something I like, like a little more. Um, I don't have a book this month. I have a TV show. Um, it's a little known TV show called Wednesday on Netflix. <laughs> um, so if you haven't heard of it, it's um, based on the character of Wednesday Adams from the Adams family. I'm recommending it because it falls into that like gothic, gothic theme. And in the show, Wednesdays, she's at a boarding school for, they're called outcasts, but they're really kids with supernatural powers. You have like vampires and werewolves and sirens at this school. And Wednesday is, of course, goth and um, kind of emotionless. So she really struggles to connect with her classmates and gets on the bad side of the principal. And while she's at the school, she discovers she has psychic abilities and she uses those to help solve a series of grisly murders in the area. And it kind of reminds me of Buffy in that you've got like high school and coming of age and supernatural stuff. And like Buffy, it's very funny and smart. And many of the episodes were directed by Tim Burton, which I think gives you a good idea of the feel or vibe of the show. And yeah, just like a fun, nice, easy watch. That was an awesome series. Yeah. I was very impressed by uh, Jenna, Jenna, Ortega. Jenna Ortega. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's incredible very incredible performance. Very magnetic. Yeah. yeah. And actually, your, your recommendation reminds me, like, uh, Rebecca is a gothic novel, but there aren't any goths in it. I mean, come on. <laughs> this is Danvers is kind of goth. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Especially yeah. the uh, Kristen uh, Scott Thomas uh, <laughs> interpretation. Uh, so for my book recommendation, I'm going to recommend, I think I've recommended this one before, but um, The Fifth Business by Robertson Davies. 
as I mentioned, one of the things that struck me about this novel is how the narrator, the new Mrs. De Winter, is never referred to by her name. And my theory is it's because she's not that important a character. She was primarily a narrator and that she could have been replaced by almost anybody because the real story was about Rebecca in the end. Not even Rebecca and Max necessarily, but Rebecca specifically. In The Fifth Business, the story is ostensibly about Dunstan Ramsey, an aging history teacher at a college, wherein he recounts his life from childhood until old age. The writing and story are interesting in and of themselves, but like in Rebecca, Dunstan's story isn't the real story that's ultimately being told, and that moment when you realize what's actually happening is amazing. Uh, the Fifth Business is the first part of the Detford trilogy. I haven't read the others. Because my brother, who first put me onto the fifth business, advised me not to bother with the rest of them. They, they tell the story from the perspectives of the principal characters in the real story, but they don't have the impact that uh, the fifth business has. So anyways, if you buy my theory especially, you'll, you'll like the fifth business. <laughs> and now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, wherein our panelists chat about words that caught our imagination recently. My word is taken straight from our novel. And if you remember when the narrator is poking around that uh, cottage, she comes across Ben, who is the uh, local kind of... Uh, Idiot. Yeah. Simpleton, perhaps. <laughs> Half it was okay as they to refer say to that, him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that it was a different time. Uh, but he was on the hunt for winkles. Hmm. And I had no idea what these were, so I looked them up. The full name of these things are periwinkles. And they are small sea snails. But, of course, they're not anything to do with the flowering plant, which you would be surprised because they're, every other flowering plant was mentioned in Rebecca. <laughs> but periwinkle, uh, they're mostly eaten in the coastal areas of Scotland, England, Wales, and Ireland, where they are commonly referred to as winkles, or in some areas, buckies, willocks, or wilks. And in Belgium, and this, I threw this in especially for our new listener from Belgium, they are called uh, coricles or caracoles. They came over to North America in the mid-19th century, most likely as uh, parasites on rocks that were used as ballasts in the hulls of ships. So they are found on the east coast of North America. When you're in Scotland, they are sold in paper bags uh, <laughs> with a pin. And because the way you eat them is you have to stick the pin in and kind of knock off this little kind of cap that holds the, the meat in, and then you stick the pin in, and you scrape out the meat, and you eat it. And I think it's probably like a tiny little bit of a, amount of meat per winkle. So I don't know, you know why you'd even bother with it. One final thing I want to say about this, apparently, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the record for the farthest a human has spat a winkle <laughs> is 10.4 meters by Alain Jourdain uh, from France, and he did that in 2006. So... Uh, I didn't really know that winkle spitting was a thing, but congratulations to Alan uh, Jordan, and may your winkles always spit far. <laughs> That's fascinating. <Yeah. laughs> I'm wondering now where the color periwinkle comes from. I guess from the flower? Probably. Mm, yeah. I no. feel like in my... What came first? In my researches, I feel like I read something about that, but I didn't make a note of it mm. because I was only focused on the snail. Yeah, fair mm. enough. Perhaps in the, uh, in the show notes, <laughs> I can uh, answer that question. So I have a bit of a theme um, this month, and I was just interested in the term goth or gothic and how it evolved from this book, which is considered gothic literature, um, to the term goth as we know it today. So I did some research, and there are varying usages of the word. It seems to start with the Goths, who were a Germanic people in very early history, like the 1st to 5th century. Don't ask me how they got their name. It has something to do with the Gothic language, which is extinct. And then the term Gothic pops up hundreds of years later to describe a style of medieval art. And here's where we get Gothic architecture, which was prevalent in Europe from the late 12th to the 16th century. And then another couple of hundred years later, in the 18th century, we get gothic fiction, and it's called gothic fiction because a uh, characteristic of it at the time was that it was set amid gothic architecture. But gothic fiction is just a very loose literary aesthetic of fear and haunting, and it's distinguished from other scary or supernatural fiction by the specific theme of the present being haunted by the past, 
especially through ruined buildings, which are proof of a previously thriving world, Mm. which is something I didn't know about Mm. and obviously applies here. And Gothic fiction, though it started in the 18th century, is still very much a thing. You have writers like Stephen King and Anne Rice and Shirley Jackson who write Gothic, what is considered Gothic literature. And then so from Gothic literature, we again jump ahead a couple hundred years to the late 1970s when we get this moody, dark music coming out of the post-punk genre. So bands like The Cure and Joy Division, and it's termed goth rock. And like many music genres, it gives rise to its own subculture, which has actually survived a lot longer than others of the same era. You know, the goth subculture that we that we know and love today that we associate with, you know, black hair and dark clothes and dark music. So there you go. That's a, a short history of goth and gothic. Hmm. I'm glad you made those connections. That actually is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the goth people have anything to do with what has become of the of the word. No, doesn't yeah. sound like it. Yeah. And you didn't mention Visigoths at all. No, I that I, that seems to complicate things even more. You're saying that the ancient uh, German tribes didn't walk around wearing black and uh, kind of were um, sullen. Not as far as I know, hmm. but maybe. Oh, my word for this month is Avenger which is someone who inflicts punishment as a response to some wrong that has been done to them or on behalf of someone else who has been wronged. It derives from the word vengeance, which dates back to the 14th century. Now, you might think this word came to mind because I was thinking of Mrs. Danvers taking vengeance upon Maxim de Winter for murdering Rebecca, but no, that's not it. And you might think I'm a fan of a particular series of movies set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but that's not it either. The real reason the word comes to mind is that my wife and I were shopping recently and I was stuck in traffic behind a Dodge Avenger and I couldn't help but think that that was a stupid name for a car. Because what is it avenging? Like what wrong is being punished by the existence of this car? And why do we have vigilante cars roaming our streets and highways? This doesn't seem quite right. Avenger. Is it a kind of truck? No, it's a car, oh. like a, a somewhat sporty kind of car, I think. Not like super sporty. Okay. I was I picturing know. a truck. Could be avenging uh, poor uh, gas mileage. <laughs> <laughs> By having bad gas mileage? <laughs> <laughs> I will avenge attempts to improve gas mileage by, I don't know, I can't actually tell you what the gas mileage is on one of those. Well, speaking of that, I don't even know what a Corolla is. Is I'm assuming it's a thing. It's the type of car I have, we have, but... Is it a thing? I don't know. Some car names are just entirely made up. They didn't exist before, but people like the sound of them. Mm. Like Kodak, like the cameras company. Do you know what Kodak comes from? I don't. Nothing. The the person who started the company, it was they wanted a word that started and ended with K because it's a strong sound, and they just made up Kodak. Mm. And it works. Everyone remembers Kodak. (laughs) Not anymore. No? Wasn't film dead? Well, yeah, but Kodak still makes... Actually, I don't know. Am I out of touch? Would, yeah, a, I mean, would, a, would a 20-year-old look at me and say, what are you talking about? It's 2023. So. Yeah, 2023. we should survey ah. some 20-year-olds to see if they know what Kodak is. Mm. No, I don't want to. Now I'm feeling old. <laughs> okay. So, unfortunately, that's all the time we have this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. So, for next month... You didn't sound sincere there. I was sincere. You sounded like you're just like, dear readers... Yeah, well, well, like I you're mean, obligated to say it. I mean, I say it every month, but we do really appreciate people want to listen. Most listening. months, I, I really, I believe it. <laughs> I feel like this, this month you were just you didn't care but about the listening. But if I say it again now, it's not gonna, it's gonna sound forced because you're you're shaming me into repeating. No, nope, not at all. I just, uh, I probably this is a situation where I probably should have thought something <laughs> and just kept it to myself. But now I said it out loud. Now it's become a thing. Carry on, Dennis. <sighs> Or sorry again, whatever dear, you want. Dear, You're the editor. You can edit all this out. Dear reader, I promise we do really appreciate you listening to us. Um, Toby, I can't, Toby I, and I do, for sure. I'm not sure about this. <laughs> I do. One of the greatest joys of my life is when someone comes up to me and goes, I know your voice. Mm. I've heard it before. And uh, it, it, and that they listen to the show and <laughs> actually like appreciate it. Don't, don't listen to Trevor. We, we all appreciate you. Anyway, so we've talked about fiction, nonfiction, graphic novels, poetry, But you know what we haven't tried yet? A play. So we're going to discuss a play next month, and not just any play. For next month, we're going to read and discuss Women of the Fur Trade by Frances Konkin. 
In 1800 and something something, somewhere on the banks of a reddish river in Treaty 1 territory, three very different women, with a preference for 21st century slang, sit in a fort sharing their views on life, love, and that hot nerd Louis Riel. Marie Angelique, a Métis Taurus, is determined to woo Louis, a Métis Libra, who will be arriving soon by sending him boldly flirtatious letters. Eugenia, an Ojibwe Sagittarius, brings news of rebellion back to the fort after trading and isn't impressed by Louis's true mediocre nature. And Cecilia, a pregnant British Virgo, is anxiously awaiting on her husband's return from an expedition, but can't resist pining over the heartthrob Thomas Scott, Irish Capricorn, who is actually the one secretly responding to Marie Angelique's letters. This will all go smoothly, right? This lively historical satire of survival and cultural inheritance shifts perspective from the male gaze onto women's power in the past and present through the lens of the rapidly changing world of the Canadian fur trade. Have comments or book suggestions for us? Send us an email. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all our past episodes there too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us too. And until next time, make sure you find Time Time to Read. Some dandy named Maxim. I'm not gonna say dandy. Let me start this again. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> they were very important in the uh, fall of some empire, the European. Oh no, leave this out. There was there was there was a big. <laughs> they were very important in some aspect of of history, but now it's escaped me.